chapter 5, beginning in verse number 8, here in just a moment. So good to see each and every one of you here this morning, and I know that we had a very wonderful week this past week with our home mission launch session, and I'll go ahead and give you kind of a sneak peek. Phase 2 of our home mission DNA project will be coming up, I believe John told me, around May, in which we will have another session called the Circle of Influence, and we'll be finding out more about that as that time comes uh, in the month of May. But keep John and Susie in your prayers. They're getting ready to, here in a few days, take off for the Midwest. They're going to be up in Indiana and Iowa doing some work with some congregations up there. So John thank goodness, is able to continue to, uh, his travels, and uh, Susie is able to go with him, so we're grateful for that uh, opportunity for them as they go again up to the Midwest uh, later on in the spring. This morning, I want, uh, I want you to remember uh, Bruce in your prayers. He has another dental appointment coming up tomorrow or Tuesday, uh, and let's keep him in prayer. He's just had a lot of dental work that he's had to go through here the last few uh, weeks, so let's continue to keep him in our prayers. Let's continue to keep all of our church family in prayer as we continue to battle the COVID, and uh, yet th despite that, our numbers are coming up, and we're, we're glad to see more and more of you coming back to be with us. But those of you who are watching by our stream this morning, we're grateful that you're there too. Uh, to study God's Word with us, and we'll get into our study here in just a moment, but we're going to go to our Heavenly Father for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity that we can study your Word this Sunday morning. It is our prayer, Father, that we will, as we open up the Word and read from it, we will find the treasures that you would want us to, to see, the great lessons that we can find in your Word, and we're so grateful for this time that we can study from the book of Ephesians and what pa the Apostle Paul can tell not only this church, but to the church here at West Freeway of how we can live the Christian life. And we just pray, Father, that you will bless our efforts uh, as we study your word this morning. Our prayers for our church family here at West Freeway, especially for Brother Bruce, continue to be with him as he continues to battle health issues and just continue to bless him uh, in his future visits with the doctors. Uh, we just pray that everything will go well for him as you continue to be with him and be with all of us in our journey with you each day. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. As a parallel passage this morning, and we're going to look at that here in just a little bit, kind of uh, keep in mind uh, some thoughts we're going to look at in the book of 1 John. But right, right now, I want us to focus on our text from Ephesians chapter 5. It's Ephesians 5, beginning again at verse number 8. The Apostle Paul here talking again to the church, and he talks this morning about the subject of light, the subject of light. We all know the importance of light. If we are walking in the physical realm under light, we're going to be okay. It's great that we've got, for example, this building well lit so that we can see what we're doing, we can see what we're reading, we can see where we're walking and where we're going. But if we were to have all these lights turned off and we were sitting here in this auditorium in pitch black, it would be a different story. If we were sitting here in total darkness, oh, we might be able to move a few inches or a, a little short distance, but I know if we were to try to walk back toward the back in, in this dark setting, if we had all the lights off, someone is going to trip and fall. Someone's going to walk over a pew or bump into a pew. And that's not just uh, a very good thing to do. We need light. And in the spiritual walk, we need light too. When you were baptized as a child of God and you came to rise up and walk in newness of light, the Bible tells us that we are to walk in the light. Walk in the light as he is in the light, where we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. 
We know that we're going to stumble. We know that we're going to make mistakes. We know we're going to come short of the glory of God. But by walking in the light, as John writes, and we're going to see here in a little bit in 1 John chapter 1, by walking in the light, we're going to do the best that we can and we will, we will be all right. Now, Paul here talks about in Ephesians 5, our main text, the aspect of us being children of light or imitators of God. Notice again Ephesians chapter 5 beginning at verse 8. For he says, For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. And then walk, he says, as children of light. Why, Paul? Look at verse 9. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And then he goes on to say, look at verse 11. If we're walking in the light and if we are practicing the righteous things, don't, he says, participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even, and I like this terminology here, expose them bring them to, bring them to light for it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret but all things become visible when exposed by the light for everything that becomes visible is light and finally verse 14 paul writes for this reason it says Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine upon you. Now, here's an opportunity for us to see our parallel passage that we were talking about a moment ago. Look at 1 John chapter 1. And we're going to begin, if you will, at verse 5. 1 John chapter 1, beginning at verse number 5. Here is what John writes regarding this very subject that Paul uh, has just addressed. He writes in verse 5, And this is the message we have heard from him and announce to you that, and here's the source of it all, brethren, God is light. So kind of just underline that in your mind for a moment. Here is where the source of all of our light comes from. God, for God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. And here's the, here's the key. Here's the whole matter. If we walk in the light as He Himself, who's He Himself? God, because God is what? God is light. We have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So it's very important for us to recognize that we as children of God need to be walking in the light and realize where that light comes from. It's from God. It's from God. God's people have been always called upon to walk in in light, in the realm of righteousness and holiness. As we've just read from this te uh, reading here in 1 John and from our text this morning in Ephesians chapter 5, we as Christians are to walk as children of light. Walk in the light. So he describes for us how this is to be done. And we've, again, already have seen our text, but let's break it down, shall we? and start looking at the key phrases or thoughts that Paul tells us. Number one, Paul says that we must bear fruits of light. Now, think for just a moment, if you will, what we as Christians are to do in our life, and that we are to bear fruit. We are not to be a dormant uh, branch on the vine. Remember in John, the 14th chapter, 
Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. The branches are to bear fruit, fruit of good works, fruit of, of good things, fruit of, in, in this case, fruit of righteousness, fruit of, of things that are not in darkness. In a previous thought, the Apostle Paul calls the works of darkness the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh. We're not to bear things of the flesh. We're to bear fruit of righteousness, fruit of holiness, fruit of goodness. Why? Because you go back to what he says in verse 8. What were you formerly? You were formerly walking in darkness, which means what? You're a sinner. Now, are we still sinners today? Pardon? Yes. We still come short of the glory of God, do we not? But what's the objective here? The objective is to start walking in the light. And he says, even here in our text, to not participate in unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead expose them. Make them bring them into the light. Remember what I said a moment ago at the top of the lesson? When you put something into the light, it's more evident. You're, you're going to be able to see it. Light Light exposes. Light shows things up. What's that? What? Say that one more. It, it yes, yes, expels the darkness. So once again, when you put something under light, you're going to be able to see it for what it is. You know, sometimes we have uh, things at the house that get a little dusty. When you put that thing that's got the dust all over under the light, you can really see all the, the dust bunnies. <laughs> it's exposing it. So here, Paul says, you need to not walk in the darkness, but bear fruit of light. He says, before you were converted to Jesus Christ, you were living in darkness. You were living in sin. But not only that, brethren, there's a couple of other aspects to think about, too, that is under this realm of darkness. Not only sin, what about ignorance? You're ignorant of things. You're not fully aware. You don't have all the knowledge about it. Here's something else under the realm of darkness. Religious error. Religious error. If it's something that you think is right, but it doesn't follow the, the context of the Word of God, it's not right, but it's error. It's either or. So we need to realize that it's just not sin that is talked about here under this realm of darkness. It also can be described as ignorance, and it can also be described as religious error. Because of this, the church is now living vastly different lives in what they formerly, uh, formerly lived. Look, if you will, for a moment over at the book of Philippians. Let's look at Philippians chapter 2 for a moment. Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 14. Philippians 2, beginning at verse 14, he says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, Children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. Lights in the world. He goes on to say finally here, 
in verse 16, holding fast the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may cause to glory, I may have cause to glory because I did not run in vain nor toiled in vain. You are, as Paul says here, even in Philippians 2, you are to appear as children of light, not children of darkness. There's a stark contrast into what we used to be. Those things are in the past now. We're striving to do better. We're striving to please God. And yes, as we do come short, yes, as we do make mistakes, yes, as we do stumble, our objective is to pick ourselves back up, ask God for forgiveness, and do what? Do better. Continue to make those changes. The change that you make, brethren, in the Christian life is not an overnight success. It's just not going to change just like that. It's going to take time. It's going to take your entire lifetime to run this race. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. And we need to stay focused each day of the race. And when we stay focused, we are walking in the light. People should see change, though, in us when we are converted. Yes, as I said, yeah, we're going to make mistakes. But they still should see that we should be better than the way we used to be. Back to our text. Notice what he says here now in verse 9. The fruit of the light is the phrase here, or the fruit of the Spirit. So some will say fruit of the Spirit. Some may say fruit of the light. But they are one and the same. One who lives in the light is going to do what? Produce fruit of light. When we walk as children of light, that means we walk in the light of of God's Word. Psalm 119, verse 105. Also notice what he says in Psalm 119 and verse 30. The entrance of your words, the psalmist says, gives what? Light. Gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. So that word, that word, the Bible, God's Word, when put to use, in my life, in your life, is going to do what? Produce fruit or fruits of goodness, fruits of righteousness. Notice what he says here in verse 9. The fruit of the light consists in three things. Number one, it consists in all goodness. Secondly, it consists in righteousness. Thirdly, it consists in truth. When we're walking in the light, we're walking in what? The, the truth of God. When we're walking in the light, we're walking in His goodness. When we're walking in light, we're walking in His righteousness. Those elements matter so, so much. So when we put the Word of God into our life and put it to use and put it to practice, or in other words, we practice what we preach, we're producing that which is good. It produces righteousness. It produces, produces righteous living in God's sight. It produces a life of truth. Notice what Paul is urging the church here at Ephesus to do. He's urging the church to do the same thing that he said in Galatians 5 and verse 25. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians 5. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. In other words, we're following the directions of the Holy Spirit by following the Word, the Spirit's Word. And notice what he says here now in verse 10. We are trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And are we, as I said a moment ago, we're not going to learn it all in one sitting. It's not just going to fall into our lap and 
We've got it mastered in a day. He says by living the kind of life, and we live that life the rest of our life, walking in the light, the church, Christians, demonstrate to the world the kind of life that is pleasing and acceptable to the Lord. How many of us are striving to live righteous life before our neighbors, before our friends, before our co-workers? Or do we mix in with, with what they're saying and what they're doing? That shouldn't be. We're not, again, what are we doing? We're not walking in darkness any longer. We're walking in the light. We're, we're not children of darkness anymore. We're children of light. We are to live the kind of life walking in the light and to demonstrate to the world the kind of life that is pleasing and acceptable to God. What does Paul say to the church in Rome? Notice what he says in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you, pre that you present your bodies a, a living sacrifice, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And he goes on to say, be not, con be not conformed to the world, but what? transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good or if that is good and the acceptable and perfect will of God. Notice the key phrases here that Paul writes in Romans chapter 12. He says, present, number one, your bodies. You're, you're supposed to present to the world and to yourselves what kind of life God wants us to live. And that is a life that is a holy life a life that is acceptable to God. And notice what he also says. Don't be conformed to the world. Don't shape or don't fashion or don't pattern yourself after the way the world is living. But instead, be transformed. I'm always, always amazed by the cartoon, The Transformers. That's such a, a, a neat thing to watch, how you can see a, a, a truck or a car suddenly transform into this giant robot that could be a robot of destruction or a robot of good. But that's why they call it the Transformers. Now, a lot of folks just may see you as someone that's ordinary. You've transformed yourself not to the ordinary person of the world or to all the others of the world, but you have transformed yourself to what? Someone that is living a righteous life. Someone that is walking in the light, not in darkness, but again, in the light of God. You have transformed yourself by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We must approve the things that are excellent, according to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 9. So the church is admonished to always examine their conduct, to examine to see if they are walking in the light in the ways of the world, or the ways of the Lord rather, to Check your conduct. How are you going to check your conduct? How are you going to see how you live according uh, to what God's standard is? By the Word. If you're following the Word of God, if you're following the Scripture, if you're following the Bible and what it says to the best of your ability, then you have met what God wants you to do as by walking in the light, as by walking in the ways of the Lord. And that's not just only around your church brothers and sisters, my friends. That's also with your family. That's also in your work. And that's also in your community. It just doesn't stay right here within the church building. You need to continue to show the Christian life outside these walls. Walk in the light. Now notice verse 11. 
We're in Ephesians 5, chapter 8 through, uh, chapter 5, verses 8 through 14. He says here now in verse 11, the term do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. Fruitful things will produce. A, a branch off a vine, if it's cared for, if that vineyard is cared for, what's it going to produce? Good grapes. Good grapes. If you plant a tomato plant that you pick up at Lowe's or Home Depot or one of the garden centers, and you just leave that, that plant sitting in the pot, is it going to produce tomatoes? No. If you don't take care of it, that tomato plant that's still sitting there in that little, little pot is going to die. You got to put it to use. So what do you do? You take it out of the little pot, you put it in the soil, and is that it right there? Is that all you do? No, you've got to water it. Throw a little fertilizer upon it. You'll eventually have to stake it so it will support the tomatoes that come off that vine or, or that plant. And you've got to watch for what? Those pesky insects, the enemy to your tomato plant. Because if you don't get rid of the pests that eat on your tomato plant, it's going to die. You're not going to have any tomatoes later on. So you've got to take care of things. And that's what we as Christians are to do. We're supposed to produce off the vine, and we're supposed to be active on the vine, not to be unfruitful. Unfruitful produces no good. Unfruitful produces only evil things, things that are not right. Works of darkness that are contaminated or contaminate the soul, which we talked about a moment ago. Sin can contaminate the soul. Ignorance of the Scripture, ignorance of God's Word, ignorance of God's will can contaminate the soul. Religious error can contaminate the soul. That's the unfruitful things of the world. And then he says here in the verse, have nothing to do with them. Do not participate don't fellowship with the unfruitful deeds of darkness. He says even to go out and expose them. Don't take part in it. Don't be connected with it. What happens when you mix pure water with dirty water? Is that going to be drinkable? No. If you mix the two together, it's not going to work. You need If you want something refreshing to drink, you don't drink dirty water mixed with pure water. It's got to be the pure, unadulterated water. Pure water, when it's contaminated, is no longer pure water. Notice the idea of not fellowshipping. He says here, don't fellowship with the works of darkness. Don't show approval of evil in any way. Now, what's this going to include? Well, as I said a moment ago, three things. Don't participate in the sinful deeds of the world. Don't go along with them. Don't approve of them. He says also, when you're talking about unfruitful, dark, uh, we, uh, unfruitful things, don't participate in religious error. Follow the truth. Study the Word. Ask questions if you're concerned about your religious walk with, with God. Talk to one of the ministers. Talk to one of the, here, talk to one of the elders at West Freeway. We'll be glad to sit down and, and counsel with you and study with you on things that concern your soul. But don't participate, don't fellowship, or connect yourself with the unfruitful works of darkness. But he says to expose them, bring them to light. It's something that will help people when they see that, that work of darkness exposed. Some do not want to do this, though, and refuse to do so. Some will say, well, it's okay. 
It's okay what they're doing today. The, don't pay no attention to it. No. Paul says that we have an awesome responsibility as a child of God, and that is we're to take the works of darkness and tell others, don't involve yourself in it. Don't participate in it. Don't connect yourself with it. Expose it. Bring it to the light. Those who belong to the realm of light cannot be neutral with respect to the works of darkness. Now, would you say that's a true statement right there? Let me say, let me say it again. Those who belong to the realm of light cannot be neutral with respect to the works of darkness. In other words, it's you're for it or you're against it. One's not to be nice to a wicked man by endeavoring to make him feel that he's okay, that what a fine fellow he is. And we were talking about a moment ago sin and ignorance of God's will and religious error. I recall one time Brother Curtis Ramey telling us a story uh, when we went on a campaign up to Galesburg, Illinois, and we were do doing door knocking up there. And a lady was studying with one of our members from the, the campaign team, and that lady was ready to be converted to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But she said, before we do this, I want to go talk to my preacher. Now listen to the rest of the story. I want to go talk to my preacher. She goes and she talks to the preacher. And the preacher, if I may use you as a prop, <laughs> she's, the preacher said, you're fine where you are. You're okay. Don't worry about what they said. Where you are, you're all right. Now, I wonder what happened to that lady after the preacher said that, that very thought. You know, I hope she changed. She changed her mind. We don't know. But that's very dangerous, brethren, when someone comes up to you and says, you're okay where you are. And it's just like take, going to someone who's, who's living a life of sin and says to that very person, hey, don't, don't worry about your spiritual welfare. You're fine where you are. That's not the right thing to say. That's not the right thing to do. What are we trying to do? We're trying to convert them out of error and convert them and try to bring them into the light. Expose their darkness and bring them to the light to remove the cancerous tumors. You know, if, if someone has cancer, what are you going to do? You're going to try to do all you can to rush them and get them into uh, a hospital so that they can have that cancer removed. You're not going to let that cancer fester and continue to grow and become worse. It's something that needs to be taken care of, and it's something that is what? Urgent. Now, is sin urgent? You bet it is. The life of sin is something to urgently be taken care of. Paul writes here in verse 12, For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. And works of darkness are done in secret. The more vile, the more wicked, the more shameful than others, even when done in secret. But yet, God sees all and knows all. He has the all-seeing eye. Notice what else he says here in verse 13. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light, for everything becomes visible in the light. In other words, when we put it, into the light of God's Word. God's Word will help us to see what it's all about. God's Word will expose the truth of what sin and religious error is all about. We need to remember the words of what John writes in John 3, verses 19 through 21. And this is the com com condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds are evil or were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. 
He who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds might be seen that they have been done in God. And finally, let's look at verse 14. Paul says, for this reason, it says, awake sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine upon you. The man in sin is depicted as a man sleeping while driving a car. Have you ever dozed off behind the wheel? It happened to me a few years ago. I was driving home from work, and I had gone to work like at 3 in the morning. Uh, I had to get some things done. So I, my day finished up around 1, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and I was driving home, and I got so close to the house, but at the time that I was driving home, I was, I was dozing. I was nodding. And the next thing I know, I, my car hits a curb and almost takes out a light pole. Damaged my car. I had to pull it off to the side of the road and get it towed in and, and repaired. Why? Because I was about to fall asleep. Matter of fact, I did. I fell asleep at the wheel and nearly got into a serious crash that could have caused physical harm as well as damage to my vehicle. Don't be sleeping behind the wheel. But the same can be said of our spiritual life. A man in sin is like a man sleeping while driving his car. He's, in other words, he's what? He's unaware of the dangers that he is in. Paul calls upon him to wake up and be aware of what surrounds you. Be aware of what sin and danger you're in. Realize the danger you're in and take, take precaution, take necessary steps. Do what is necessary to be saved. Listen to what is said in John 5 and verse 25. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. The dead are spiritually dead are doing what? They're walking in darkness. The alien sinner needs to comply with the words of God. Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too should also walk in newness of life. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. What's Paul saying here to the church at Rome? Walk in newness of life. That's walking in the light. That's what we've been talking about here this morning in Ephesians chapter 5. That's what we've been talking about here in John chapter 1. To walk in the light, not to walk in darkness. Don't become spiritually dead again. Walk in the light as he is in the light. Therefore, we'll have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. But also, a verse that we didn't read there, and that was 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8. But I'm going to say it to you right now because this is what we need to be careful of as a child of God. As we uh, continue to walk in the light today, be careful of this very thought. If we say that we have no sin... We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Don't be deceived. Know that the truth of God is in you. Know that you are walking in the light. And when you do come short of the glory of God, confess that sin because the Lord is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is a privilege to you as a child of God as you walk in the light. You have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. May Christ's light shine upon you as we close our message this morning.